know God breed on this. I know God breed on this. The new brand for upcoming creators. The Facebook for creators. The community of creatives. That's what collective is to me, is kind of giving creatives a voice. What's up, everybody? It is Kelsey Davis here. I'm the founder and CEO of Collective, also the host of the Every Human podcast. And today I am going to be talking to Rebecca Dene, who's an incredible social sculpturist, uh, community activist, as well as visual artist. So let's get into it and learn more about her story. Hey, friend. Hey, friend. How are you living? Pretty good. Ah, such a joy for you to be here today. Thank you. I'm super excited to talk to you. Um, you're just someone who, you know, like your your spirit really transcends into everything that you touch. Mm. Um, from conversations, the work that you do, to the spaces that you curate. Um, and so really excited today to just dive into your creative journey, learn more about who you are um, and how that you kind of inspires and touches everything that you do. So with that, who is Rebecca Dene? Mm, who is Rebecca Dene? I'm an artist. I work in a few different disciplines. Been in Tulsa for a decade. Before that, I grew up in West Texas. So I feel like West Texas, Midland, and Tulsa are the communities that made me. And that's who I am. Awesome. Yeah. And how do you kind of think about, um, I guess, the verticals of, of what you do? Mm, what say. do you mean by the like, verticals? Of so what, what are the different, I guess, the verticals of what I would mm -hmm. say maybe I do is like maybe the vert film is like yeah, one yeah. world, uh, you know, technology, um, you know what I mean? Uh, I like to think I'm a communicator, whether it's through, you mm -hmm. know, work that I do with like, let's say the AT&T stuff or even mm -hmm. the podcast, um, ultimately just kind of connecting people but those are maybe the the yeah. lanes if you will that I operate totally. like how would you kind of how do you think about um you know the different industries of you know where you kind of show up totally I would say visual art is the main lane and industry but then I closely link that to social sculpture and so social sculpture is the idea that anything can be art and for me that looks sometimes like the way I work with people, the way I work with experiences. So the work right now is really installation-based, experience-based, and then all like under the guise of this idea of visual art, which has gotten so loose today. I mean, people are doing like sound practice and all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So it's an art practice that is also informed by a background in community organizing and advocacy yeah. that I think is like an undercurrent of, you know, how I ended up really interested in this idea of social sculpture. And I was going to say, kind of break down the, what gives, gives some people who maybe don't know about social mm. sculpture and everyone's been in them or access to it. It's, um, but what, I guess, give us reference points of yeah. what are maybe historically different social sculptures that mm. have existed that maybe people would understand a context of. Mm, for sure. So, I mean, Joseph Boys came up with that concept and I probably should know way more references to like well-known social sculpture, but I think my draw to it was really in the community organizing work that I was doing, realizing that as a creative, everything I do is just going to get a little funky and mm -hmm. get a little artistic along the way. And I think you operate that way mm -hmm. as well, mm -hmm. you know, like no matter what you're building and making, even if it's not what might traditionally be considered art, like a painting or a sculpture, it inevitably, when an artist is doing it, it becomes art. Mm -hmm. And that really hit home when I wasn't in this like full-time creative life and in this full-time creative role. I think it was empowering to mm -hmm. feel like the things I was making and building still counted. Did you see it as art at the time? I think it took, um, it took some time. I mean, I remember the moment that I did. I had put together, right as the pandemic was hitting, like a weekend experience that was gonna r run for four days. We had spent a year planning it. Um, tons of Tulsans that I love were involved mm -hmm. and it was like this culminating event that I was really proud of. And it clicked for me that not only that was an art piece I had put together alongside my community really collaboratively, but all the work I had been doing um, in a community organizing capacity like was artistry. Would you relate, um, so in that breath, how would you distinguish what maybe a traditional just community mm. organizing is mm. versus at what point makes it art? 
Like mm. what, like in, and I guess that goes with anything, right? Of like, yeah. arguably, you know what I mean? Like I could have a piece of paper right yeah. here, just do something to it. At what point is it like, oh, that's a doodle versus like, and that's art. How do you right. distinguish these things that maybe like, cause when I hear that, it almost even sounds hope, you know, when we say every human is a creator, a lot of times a community organizer wouldn't think about themselves right. um, as an artist, right? Mm -hmm. So what kind of creates that distinguishment for you where it goes beyond um, a traditional way about thinking about something like being a community organizer mm. or maybe an event planner or things like that into like, no, we're really creating social sculptures through what we're mm -hmm. doing and, and you're an artist in that, not just an organizer. I mean, maybe just the intention. I mean, it's that like, what is art question? Mm. I feel like people are always asking that and it's like a fun mm. dinner or podcast conversation, yeah, yeah. I guess. But I definitely don't think I'm positioned to like, you know, say what is art and what isn't. But yeah. I think that the intention behind it really matters. No, I like intention because yeah. even when I think about um, something like any being any community created, organizer that decides they want to be an artist and call it artistry, all in. Yes, I agree. And I think it's, we say the same thing. At the point in which someone chooses, hey, like I identify as a creator, like mm -hmm. you become one. And mm -hmm. I think even to that mm -hmm. point, like, you know, I believe that being a creator, having this creativity as a human is like a big part of what makes us different maybe as a species in the mm -hmm. sense of I could see a problem, I could have an idea, you could see a problem, have an idea, we can talk to each other and birth a third thing mm -hmm. beyond reproductively, but yeah. being able to like actually create a new thing that then gets pushed into society that people can actually engage with and operate with. And I think what's so interesting is because when you say intention is the thing for you at least that kind of creates that mm -hmm. difference, like when you think about something that's created versus maybe something that just happened, mm -hmm. you think about intention, right? Mm -hmm. Like um, a chair, for example, uh, uh, you know, it, it could be used for a lot of things. Mm -hmm. It was created to allow people to sit, mm -hmm. right? The intention was, okay, we're going to build it in this way so that people sit, they have something on their back. Like it's a very, it's a user experience that was thought of with based on what the intention to be. Mm -hmm. Now you could also use a chair to be a stage, right? Mm -hmm. You could use a chair to, I don't know, be a weapon maybe, right? Um, but maybe you're not gonna actually be able to utilize the full function of what it was created for because mm -hmm. that wasn't maybe the intention of what the artist put into it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, for you, how do you kind of think about, you know, when go, go back in time mm -hmm. in terms of when you first realized your behaviors were producing art, right? So if mm -hmm. you're saying that like community organizing is art, like w were you a kid already even doing certain things, whether it's like drawing, coloring, or... Um, creating spaces for conversations on the playground. Like, how do you think about yeah. the first times where you're like, oh, wow, I'm intentionally thinking about something and then seeing something happen and being like, whoa. Yeah, I mean, I have this compulsion to create. Someone said that to me recently mm -hmm. and it has really stuck mm -hmm. with me. Like, I think no matter where you put me, no matter the life circumstances, like I'm going to create. Mm -hmm. It is like absolutely a compulsion. I mean, you can see that in the place that I live yeah. and the things I do each yeah. week. Um, it is just a compulsion. Yeah. And I think that it's always been there. Like, you know, as a small kid, I was making all kinds of things. Like some of the first things I made were like things with twigs and leaves and mud, like yeah. in the backyard behind the bushes yeah. or like pipe cleaners or something I always had access to. So I made like all kinds of things out of pipe cleaners. Yeah. But I grew up around it too. Like my mom is a gardener and a seamstress. Okay. Um, my dad does all kinds of carpentry and it was more um, hobby for them, but they took it really serious. They perfected those hobbies to a large degree. And mm. so I think being in that environment only like encouraged and fostered, fostered me to do that. So like we had a sewing room in the house mm -hmm. and it, that sewing room was like full of crafting materials. So having access to that, led to me making all kinds of things yeah um I made like my clothes in high school and then in college I was an art major and so that really like amped it up a bit it's so crazy <laughs> we had a sewing room at home because my mom yeah, had, sewing had room. A, a craft that like she's an accountant okay yes. my mom Doesn't too is an accountant so crazy. yes <laughs> accountants with sewing room <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> which is wild like now as an adult uh my girlfriend reminds me all the time like yeah like Sometimes I'm like, mom, like, just da da da, like, oh, you're thinking in the line. She's like, bro, your mom is like the ultimate creator in the way that you think about it. Mm. I guess I've, j I've just never thought about, you know, as a kid, for example, like, 
if my you know I was I've always been a tall lanky person um kind of like yeah, you can relate <laughs> and as I was growing my mom would like add things to the bottom of my pants yes, to extend them because she'd be like oh you don't need the extra pants you like we we'll just we'll you just know do that yeah <laughs> and so I think little things like that I'd be like what like no like I appreciate the the, the creativity and you're just trying to get something off <laughs> my mom can I just get some new pants can we please like, just go buy some yeah and so longer pants. maybe I kind of um I didn't really appreciate that mm. as much. Now that I'm someone, it's like, okay, I'm traveling all the time. I'm doing business. I'm trying to, I'm getting things custom tailored. Yeah. Da, da, da. I'm like, there's, I'm literally hitting my mom. Like, or like when my mom <laughs> totally. comes in town in Tulsa, I'm like, yo mom, like bring your stuff. Yes. Like, we have a sewing machine now at the crib. Yes. Yes. I have yes. a list of patterns I'd like for you to cut out and make and all that. And it's like, I think sometimes we don't actually value, um, like even when you say like, you have a parent who's a farmer and like, mm -hmm. or a gardener and like, um, the level of impact of how if someone just not because you know they're making money from it because they, they're just genuinely trying to pour yeah. into something yeah seeing the efficacy of like what that puts into their spirit by the fruit that's bared in that place right mm -hmm. so like i can't imagine as a kid, or i can't imagine on the sewing side like i knew the value of what that did for my mom mm -hmm. when like she just makes stuff for people at the church and like i'd, I'd be like mom why do we need a whole sewing room like, you don't even do this as, like, a profession. But, yeah. like, she just, well, she's like, oh, we have that rooms in the house. It's something that I want to pour into. Yeah. What was it like for you as a kid seeing just, I love, I guess, a level of joy rooted in things that were outside of your mm. traditional work? Like, what life did that give you seeing parents and, like, loved mm. ones just, like, pour into things? Because they're like, no, I just want to do that. And maybe you're getting really good at it. Yeah, it was such a great model. And I think it was a model that my parents both had from their parents, too, like in the way that they worked, it involved. And it, for my grandparents, I'm not so sure that it was, well, I don't know. They they did have these like kind of interesting hobbies, but it was a sewing especially was born out of like necessity. Mm -hmm. It was more cost effective, you know, less so now, but it was to provide, you know, mm -hmm. kind of like adding mm -hmm. to the pants, mm -hmm. right? So, although she might have just been doing that to yeah. make you some Sometimes I still don't know. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I, I think we have the money. Y'all need to just dig really in. To yeah, well, she just really <laughs> wanted to do that. Um, I think that it, it was such a good model in terms of like their self-expression mm. and I definitely think it contributed, like I can see how it contributed to their healing because it was something that they were often doing for themselves or like in their quiet time or in their alone time. And so I can see how that really mm. like fostered something within them. Um, but I think hearing you talk about like the sewing room, mm -hmm. you know, I think like Virginia Woolf talks about a room of one's own and mm. that really hits home for me, like something about space to create. Like we have that in Tulsa. There, if we have, something it's like resources space mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. in a way that it doesn't exist in the city that's why like I base here and I do my work from here it's one of the many reasons but and you create those types of environments for other people to be so that they yeah. have space and time yeah I want yeah. that for all of us because yeah. I think you know we deserve it we need it but I think that it modeled that you know my dad in the garage had a place that like he did his creative activities. My mom had this sewing room. There was this garden in the backyard and that model of like a home and a life is worthy of spaces where we can create. And that's how my life since going full-time creative is modeled around. It's modeled around like the spaces where I create and the people I create alongside. So like going to bags, the boot shop, mm -hmm. spending time in like rural Oklahoma and having a dedicated, two dedicated spaces out there with community where I do leather work and then working out of an interior design studio here with an mm -hmm. artist, Chris Murphy. Um, and then my own personal art studio with clean hands where I paint, mm -hmm. like having, and then having a home that is also a very creative environment being able to like go between these creative spaces and communities is probably something you know that I learned from just my own house structure. I was going to say, and and do you um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is a framework I, I like to mm. often uh, kind of reference in the context of just ascending through life as a creator. Do you agree with the philosophy around uh, the fruits or the acts of creative expression is kind of maybe the um, the what's a good word like the output that happens when you've reached self actualization that 
create like creative expression expression so like what yeah. you said about space and I time right like the that. idea yeah. of like okay outside of the context of work the mm -hmm. importance of just literally having an environment so that you can just be getting your shit off basically mm -hmm. and knowing that um for example as a kid watching my mom like when she was in her sewing room or she was doing that mm -hmm. the level of like healing peace just mm -hmm. like freedom like that was creative expression mm -hmm. right like there's almost this level of like luxury let's say totally. of like you don't necessarily need that thing to feed you um literally the thing just feeds you spiritually or like in a certain way that like maybe like do you think that that's because other levels are taken care of like you're not thinking about physical safety psychological safety community love belonging you've kind of hit those things so now my focus becomes creative expression or and or is it more like okay let me really get into this creative expression so that i can figure out how to make money mm -hmm. from that and then climb the ladder in that way yeah i mean all of the above i do think there's a lot of truth to like the luxury and privilege of being able to create absolutely and getting to a place where you can freely do that, that we don't all have access to. And I also think that there is necessity in creating before you get there. Mm, because, that's, that's good. you know, like I first and foremost create because I have to, like if I'm going to be on this earth <laughs> yeah. and I'm going to keep doing this thing, I have to create. Independent I have to of things. how much you have to create from oh, yeah. where you're creating yeah. from, it's like even even if you had literally nothing but you, you're yeah. going like you are going to create from that place. Yeah, and I think I've always like known that's something that needs to be true for me. But I guess I'm two three years into like consciously making that decision of, you know, I no longer have a salary. Mm -hmm. I no longer have benefits. I'm no longer like playing by the system that I was taught and I'm going to have a lot of trust and belief in myself and yeah. my community and the opportunities that find me to keep going and knowing like I made that decision at a point where I had a lot of career experience under my belt, mm -hmm. I had a really strong network and community. Um, and I had seen mentors like Alexander Taman, Benita Cooper, mm -hmm. Onika Asimo Caesar, like seeing people take some of those leaps and do it really well. So I think it was really informed when I did that. But I mean, over the past few years, I am really kind of making it up as I go yeah. with and this what, what idea was that, that feeling like, I have um, to create. Jumping off the ledge, if you will, mm. and, and saying, you know what, like, I think I'm fine with living a life without benefits. I think yeah. I'm fine with, without maybe being a W2 worker. I think I'm maybe fine without because I have at least enough validated experiences that if I invest in myself and I trust myself as the source in which things flow, then maybe I don't have to invest or have this opportunity cost of putting my bags over here when I know it's not actually giving me the high level of value I need or the scale versus if you invest in yourself and it starts kind of working a little bit, there's, there's no ceiling in terms right. of what you can do. Right. I mean, yeah. it's been so liberating. It's been so freeing and it hasn't always been easy, but um, no regrets. Like I'm still yeah. doing it. You know, I think yeah. I get, I'm refining how I do it. I'm refining what it looks like moving forward. Um, and as you're right, there is no ceiling. So the opportunities keep coming Yeah. and it keeps building and growing. And I think I'm now in a season of like slowing down yeah. and really, um, yeah. evaluating what does it look like to keep building in that direction? But yeah, yeah I think it has felt extremely liberating. Yeah. And you talked extremely a little bit about freeing. Tulsa being a space where, you know, you really knew that this is who you are, but it's like, mm -hmm. let's, let's do this thing in Tulsa because environmentally it has something that allows you to have mm. the space and the time. Talk about that a little more. Like how would you kind of add color to why Tulsa as an environment mm -hmm. um, for you al allows you to have the space and time that you need to really kind of creatively express yourself? Yeah, I mean, I came here a decade ago and I was fresh out of art school and had every intention of making art full speed ahead, putting together a solo show. I had been painting some really large scale works um, that talked about kind of the relationship between impoverished countries, America and technology. There were, mm. um, which is really interesting when you think about like some of my work now mm -hmm. and like my interest in augmented reality and stuff. I was kind of 
really grappling with like access to money and resources and race and technology when I moved here. But I moved here in my 20s, only ever really being in like wealthy, conservative white mm-hmm. environments. Mm-hmm. And then I went and taught in North Tulsa for a few years and I stopped making art. Um, mm-hmm. I had a lot of things to figure out within myself, within my family dynamic. Um, and the North Tulsa community just poured into me. <laughs> How did you see when you say you start stop making art? That's, that's interesting to me. What, what was kind of the um, uh, why? Yeah, looking back, I mean, it was really tough and confusing for me at the time. And I guess I didn't totally stop making art. I was doing some abstract commissions mm-hmm. um, that are like kind of a series of my work all on its own. But I just didn't have any inspiration. I went from like this compulsion to create and having all these ideas like I... Yeah. I didn't have enough time to make all the things to for the first time in my life, just not having anything that I felt compelled to make. Mm -hmm. And what'd that feel like? I mean, I think at the time it was like shameful because who I, my identity is so rooted in being a creative and an artist. And like, I remember it being so tough and it lasted from that was like 20, um, 14 to 2019 Mm -hmm. I didn't really make anything that I would consider my own personal work like the way I am now and the way I was before and I didn't know if it would ever come back that like desire to just Mm. make work that I was proud of that I believed in that I had to make but as I got to kind of the end of that season like in 2019 um, there's this experience where I like knew it was time to make again I knew exactly what to make Mm. and since then I've just like it's kind of the same thing where I don't have enough like time and hands to make all the Mm -hmm. things so just putting out what I can Mm -hmm. um to the best of my ability but that was so sacred and I may have seasons like that again I mean this summer even feels a little bit like that like I need to kind of step back for a minute but I think that it was a critical time on my personal journey it was a critical time of building relationships in the Tulsa community Mm -hmm. Um, and like being nurtured in a lot of ways. And you, your question was why Tulsa, like Tulsa has nurtured me so much. Mm. And I've, I've, I hope that I'm pouring back into our community. I hope that I'm like bolstering the people around me, but Tulsa just welcomed young me with open arms Mm -hmm. and has put so much, um, like love and care into me and the way that my community growing up did too. Like Mm. I really do consider Tulsa and Midland to be the places that raised me at this point. Yeah. (laughs) But I think that that experience, and they were hard years in Tulsa. Um, Not that every year here isn't hard to some degree, but there was a lot of feeling of defeat in those years as work was happening. A lot of people were leaving. Um, It wasn't quite as flashy and exciting to stay here. And I think that just all that life experience has like Tulsa holds such a special place in my heart, yeah. you know, and all that context too is what I build and work from. Like for my work, all I can make is from my own perspective. Like I think that that's part of why I believe in the Tulsa community making art right now. I believe that this place in time, the people who are here, the history of our city, the future of what's possible our perspectives are valid in the art world. Mm -hmm. Like we have New York art scene and LA art scene and Berlin and Paris and those perspectives are valid too. But I think in 2023, Tulsans have something to say that's really critical. Even when we um, when we were in London at Christie's, like we, at a very high level, we talked about Tulsa and what, what was going on, and it's it's often the most refreshing thing in the room. Like mm-hmm. once you once you once people because it's it's like this way, what like Oklahoma, and then like maybe there's certain individual things that maybe they know about Tulsa, maybe they know mm-hmm. about oil, maybe they know about Black Wall Street, maybe. Um, that's it. And both yeah. of those things arguably happened a hundred years ago in the sense of like when that highest level of impact was. And so it's like when I'm often talking to people about what's going on in Tulsa now, it's like, wait, what? Yeah. And I think what you said about the perspective, you know, I'm from Atlanta and, you know, Outcast famously said, you know, the South got something to say. Mm-hmm. And we understood what that meant in the sense of like, man, like 
we have so much connectivity, culture, people that are just creating, connecting. Um, oftentimes, it's just a matter of like, okay, we're refining the craft and we need often these gatekeepers nationally to say, hey, undeniably, we know there's talent there. Mm-hmm. Do we think that nationally people would receive what they have to say? Mm. Right. And so there's often this, okay, cool. I know that this is cute for Tulsa, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like I know that, you know, all right, you know, whatever, Heartland region, okay. Yep. Um, but what have been even some of your experiences? I know that, you know, you mm-hmm. you've exhibited Art Basel twice now, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you're you're Once. you're Okay, for for now. <laughs> yeah, for uh, now. Twice is on the way. <laughs> See you in December. Um, for sure. Um, how do you? How would you kind of articulate the Tulsa art scene? Um, or you know, I, you know, let's say a, a global curator is watching this right now. Yeah. Um, why do you think that it's necessary for someone to maybe just like check out Tulsa or see the Tulsa art scene specifically in terms of what are they getting here that maybe you're not getting in a New York City or LA? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, post Trump presidency and. We just had the hundred year of the yeah. the centennial of the massacre. There's just a lot of perspective here, I think, mm. on racism. Mm-hmm. What does it look like to move forward with America the way it's been handed to us? And which the way is it a, which is, is an American question right now, right? And yeah. I mean, really, some of it for me, like coming from a background of community organizing and advocacy and seen the progress that we weren't always able to make in a place like Oklahoma and a place like Tulsa, there has to be another way to change healthcare, to change policy, Mm -hmm. to change all of our systems. And I don't believe that anything will change without like cultural revolution. Mm. And so long as we're operating within a white supremacist mindset subconsciously consciously Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in places like Oklahoma that's not going to change and I think art has the power and potential to do that I mean we've seen throughout history how cultural movements change people's way of being and a city's way of operating Mm -hmm. so a group of artists and musicians have immense power to do that and I think I mean we're doing it here actively people have been doing it here for decades too. Mm-hmm. It's nothing mm-hmm. new. I mean, mm-hmm. the, the artistry and the legacy of that in Tulsa is so rich, but we're doing it here either way. Mm-hmm. So I think there's a lot of reason to pay attention to it because yeah. of where we sit in time and, and the people who are here. I mean, I have so much belief in the artists that are here and the way that they're dedicated to their practice and the way that they think. I also think artists here, we don't always have access to um, the things you might see and learn at Art Basel or going to Christie's. So there's this, you know, philosophy I have that's formed over the past couple of years about the importance of when we leave and when we bring people in. Um, That doesn't need to happen constantly all the time, but I think there's really critical points where Tulsa artists should travel together and be out in the global art world and scene, shaping our craft, shaping our practice, getting ideas, getting inspiration, Mm -hmm. learning from our peers in the art world, and then coming back to our home base and developing our work here where we have that like some more, for me, solitude and Mm -hmm. time and space um, to really hone what we're saying and how we're saying it and what the work is. Cause I think the quality of our work is critical mm-hmm. for outsiders to pay attention. Mm-hmm. Um, but then there's something to this like home court advantage and bringing people into our community and like seeing us and who we are and yeah. the work that we make in our environment. Yeah. That's really powerful too. And I think we're starting to, learn what those different like going out and having people come in opportunities look like and that's been instrumental for me just doing kind of getting that rhythm for myself and all I mean that's how I ended up exhibiting at Art Basel Mm -hmm. having a curator come in for Dreamland and Spark Summit Mm -hmm. that saw a lot of different artists and what they had put on led to an opportunity where like the curator knew us and we had access to walk through that door Mm -hmm. um because otherwise, yeah, I, I'm not sure that some of those like ideas and goals will happen mm-hmm. without us 
having those relationships outside of the city. What would you kind of tell somebody who um, maybe they're like you and whether they're a community organizer, they're just someone in their own life who's inspired and kind of trying to push something out creatively in their own life. Mm -hmm. What would maybe um, you tell them to even get these bursts of inspiration of like, Mm -hmm. it seems like you've kind of learned how to, um, you know, you know that for yourself, you need space and time, but then also Mm -hmm. inspiration to actually like create. Mm -hmm. What's kind of your motivation to people um, in terms of like maybe getting past that writer's block or like they Mm -hmm. know there's something in them. They know that they're a creator, but maybe it just seems foggy. Um, You know, is it is it healing work? Is it exposing yourself to new things? So you have new reference points. Like, Mm -hmm. how do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, the years that I wasn't creating, I think my advice to my past self would have been just like more grace that it wasn't the time Mm. to be creating um, Mm. and not forcing it. A lot of people gave me advice during that time that was like, just draw every day or just just make something. And it's not that I disagree with that. There's a lot that can Mm. come from just making, right? And just like putting your hands to the work. But it really was just not the time to be making. So I think like grace and forgiveness for yourself, if you don't have something to make, maybe that's not like the healing or maybe that's not the part of the journey that you're on and trusting Mm. that if you are creative and you have that desire, you're going to have ideas again and Mm. there will come a time to create. I think when I'm in those seasons of flow where I have tons of ideas and I have all this desire to create and make, Um, the inspiration for me comes from like who I am, my lived experience, the people around me, my life, the relationships, Mm -hmm. but also travel, like seeing how other artists are speaking with their work. Um, And a lot of my inspiration comes from like retail. I'm like super inspired by clothes and retail environments. And so like pulling from that world and then speaking what I have to say from like this idea of a retail concept or clothes or wearables. Um, And I'm also super inspired by interior design. So while I don't know that I would ever, you know, take on an interior design Mm -hmm. project, I love learning from that world and Mm -hmm. then like taking those tools Mm -hmm. and putting Mm -hmm. them towards my artistry. So -hmm. like following your desires, following the things you love. I love cowboy boots. I've loved cowboy boots for forever. So like, oh, I did it. Yes. Yes. Cowboys. I mean, not cowboy boots, but sports. Go, 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 go cowboys. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think that it's like following your, your passions, like the things that you love, the things that excite you is the way I'm doing it. And then like using those things as, the tools to speak with i love that and i really love how you've also integrated like kind of this this western culture into your art right so whether yeah. the, the way that you um design through leather the way that you what you do with your cowboy boots um like it's like you're you're kind of you know helping develop this like midwestern uh culture yeah yeah that's yeah. kind of the idea right like all we have is the truth and there's all this imagery and reference that mm you know, it connects with people. That's been so interesting with like clients that I've made modified boots for with the mule ears and the harnesses, like really sitting down with people and hearing why do you love cowboy boots and all the different things people associate with that. There's always some kind of connection to like personal values Mm. and family. And there are these like Southern ideas that people want to take forward Mm -hmm. connected to like, just ducking off and like being out in nature yeah. or hard work yeah. and um, having community. your community. Yeah. So how do we like take those ideas forward and get rid of like the racism, the ignorance, yeah, like yeah, the yeah. things that are also super strongly associated with Western wear and country culture. Mm-hmm. And I think it's um, like a way to authentically build a Tulsa culture and community that a lot of us relate to. Yeah. It's not just, my work you know I think it's we're starting to see it and have been seeing it in tons of people's work and really Steph Simon helped me make that connection just in some of the things he was wearing years back like rocking the suede with the fringe and like seeing how he was wearing what he wears like what he grew up around and what his family wears Mm -hmm. and what he loves and is inspired by like Mm -hmm. gave me some sort of permission and Mm. um like inspiration to totally lean into like who I am and like 
wield that as a yeah a power Tulsa got something to say. Tulsa got something to say. We're, we're going to see soon. Um, <laughs> Rebecca, before we get out of here, uh, my favorite question to ask, um, if you had a message for every human, mm. uh, what would you want to say? Why is that question so hard? Hmm. A message for every human. Slow down. <laughs> get grounded. prioritize your healing yeah i think that's it yeah get rooted get rooted man because that's that's because with 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 being rooted and then having space time and the resources Mm. that you need you will bloom like it's just part of the creation process right awesome thank you so much rebecca thank you for having me of course every human